Hello everyone, today we talk about the Social War 9189 BC, uh, a beautiful, honestly, uh, yet uh, overlooked topic that tells a lot about the political and social reality of the late Roman Republic um, in a moment that was very tormented because of different uh, reasons, basically since the, the, the Numidian War, Rome had not, never known a moment of, of continuous peace, um, and it wouldn't, you know, f finish basically up to 32 BC. Um, this is a moment of advanced crisis, let's say, of the Roman Republic, that, as you know, was closely connected to the properly civic uh, side of the story, so always in a close of its in terms. When we study of war, we study its political and social context, otherwise can't understand anything um, of it. Um, it's, it's difficult to discuss the social war, because it's actually a complex uh, topic. Um, it's, you know, fairly simple to, to tell the story without getting into specific details about even the, the military events. But as far as the uh, internal relation of the Roman Confederation is concerned, in fact, the relation with the Allies, the Salki, hence the, the social war that has also has other names, as we will see now, um, requires definitely uh, an awareness of, of the general background, that even in here, is, I don't think it's much discussed overall. I mean, who studies Roman history naturally has a pretty good idea of the, what the, the social war was. If you read every manual, you can get that. But it, um, it, it somehow... Uh, crucial because of the the the, the truth not what the the Roman uh, world and its um, its achievements and success had been in, uh, at that point right the, the Roman um, here we we can use the term uh, empire at this point without any regret in the sense that you know that we we don't look at it merely from a from an institutional point of view because Rome was never formally an empire in 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 the, especially in this period like the the concept of imperium was something uh, deriving from 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 the skies and uh, you know attributed sacredly to the various magistracies with this faculty of properly leading uh, the army and um, what we talk about empire in this sense in the uh, in, in the measure in which Rome had began to literally control other foreign lands from the uh, the Italian heartland, that as it was populated by uh, societies that had contributed, in fact, to the Roman uh, expansion, had saved Rome, had, after all, even stayed loyal to Rome in the darkest hours. Think about the Second Punic War. I mean, um, it all comes from from a process that we haven't properly discussed because uh, I don't think we made a video talking about the Roman expansion in Italy during the fourth and the 3rd century BC specifically, so it's actually a very harsh story and uh, this is not a matter of, you know, any kind of, like, all history basically is, it's not a matter of, of charity, of, um, you know, friendship, it's really a matter of convenience, you know, of negotiation. Rome owes its unique uh, place in the history of civilization because of this capacity that eventually we have embraced ourselves um, over time to basically extend civic rights to people that objectively do not belong to our to our world to our culture but are willing to participate to it in a positive way uh, the history of rome is exclusively in a way the history of how rome managed to absorb the other populations, not how it tyrannically simply imposed itself uh, on them. Um, it's a history of cooptation, right, that passed once again, of course, through oppression um, and especially through the impoverishment of, of also of certain um, uh, realities that, you know, this is a dark history of, you know, of, of decline, of also think about the same Roman uh, citizenship in its... Um, I wouldn't say in its intrinsic meaning, but at least in, in the proper social economical divides, right? The, the, the was and you know, the history of of Rome here for three hundred years would be the one of, of a middle class which would try to stay to remain afloat, 
right? Uh, but but with on a on a large base also of proletarians that didn't have much to leave but joining the the warlords that were rising in Roman society and contributing in a sense to expand further and reward um, uh, these, these very supporters with land. The, the crucial aspect, as always in, in this pre-industrial societies, was the the uh, land assignment, also the fermentary laws, you know, something very concrete, very material. These people wanted to just to, to have a living, so, so a decent living at the end of the day. Um, so as you understand, it's, it's a complex history that, however, focuses exactly on the deep um, and intricate relations that Rome had at this point with the uh, within its confederacy uh, that was composed by this very you know different at some levels um, set of um, properly of relations with the various communities right uh, the word the foidera aequa or iniqua the word the municipia the, the, the was um, uh, there was a very varied and uh, non yet standardized system of Roman integration by 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 degrees of civic rights, right? There were the civites um, romani optimo iure, that were the, the full um, Roman citizens. We can say they had full civic rights. Uh, they were represented completely in the you know in the in the political system, albeit even in there with certain important divides based mostly on a, you know a, a social divide. Uh, democratic divide. Then there was the Latin citizenship that was um, mostly, let's say, an economical, you know, um, socio-economical one. Right? The, the Latin citizens could, for example, marry Roman women. They could, you know, they had important. Their communities had important trade uh, facilitations. So they, they were also the most loyal to Rome. So much that they will regain at this point a more during the social war fought in Italy on the Italian soil. An important military role has they had fundamentally lost it. Uh, mostly, it was the rest of the allies, the Saki, right? That were deputed to that. The Latins were important, but they had they weren't so burdened as as the Italics, uh, as the rest of the Italics, by the way, because the Latins were Italics proper themselves, just as the Romans. But um, um, there were other also non-Italic realities. Think about Etruria, um, but generally speaking. What we're seeing now is a mm, geographically a central southern Italian reality that fundamentally also excluded the Hellenic uh, cities of the um, of the coasts that were fundamentally not interested in, in to participate at, at, at a certain level because at the end of the war actually the, I think uh, Heraclea in Naples also became uh, that were Hellenic cities became Italic you know communities. Uh, for convenience and other, and sometimes also by extortion. I mean, it's a complex history, and that's why we can't tell it today all in, in one video. Today we mostly introduce it, like let's make it uh, an uh, an introduction of it, um, and uh, observing fundamentally what was the 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 process that brought to the war and uh, what. Um, also, the, the Roman politics was fundamentally thinking about this all because the second century BC um, had been a moment of crisis, as you know, from the Gracchi especially. It was recognized by at least uh, a minority of the Roman um, political body that um, the exclusion of these other populations that had fundamentally contributed to, to the Roman expansion had paid an enormous blood tribute to Rome. Right, the Italics were constantly more uh, than the Roman citizens at this point in the Roman army. Now, and the Marian reform had uh, also fundamentally uh, formalized the homogenization of these peoples. We know, you know, since the accounts of the Second Punic War, that fundamentally the uh, by the end of the third century BC, the Romans and the Italics were the same thing on the field. Right, these were literally uh, the same. Soldiers, they had the same training, the same equipment, the same, um, in part the same background, because of course the Italics shared that this, you know, the, the realization, the social war is the first time in absolute terms in which the Italics recognized themselves as something political uh, in relation to Rome, right? So that's why th this is specifically important. Um, Italy was 
it's pretty diverse in its composition, but let's say that the, the backbone of the, the Roman Confederacy and of this broader central and southern um, uh, Italian reality was composed by Italics. The Italics were a lot, right? Italy had pretty mm, large uh, agricultural and demographic resources. That's the reason, in part, why they just also Rome made it uh, a certain levels against, um, I don't know, Carthage. I mean, for example, the Carthaginians could have never conquered uh, the Italian peninsula. They might have controlled it had they won the war, kind of mm, interfering with this. The, the, the Italic Confederation confederations would have fundamentally emerged with a with a collapse of the Roman Confederation, which did risk right to happen. Um, but it, it was a, a very, you know, a rampant system in many ways. Uh, many thanks to Romanization, many interland areas had been urbanized. Right, the Italics were just fundamentally a, a step above um, populations like the the Iberians, like the Celts that had already, for which we can speak already of a sort of proto-urbanization. The Italics were basically the same level Rome facilitated their development it opened their contacts it, it was a, a harsh history as you know a history of defeats of deportation of exterminations right and the social war was um uh in a way also uh riding a bit this wave of resentment that after all the italics uh broad you know broadly meant in their society had Maintain towards Rome to maintain towards its subjugation. As you know, Rome struggled a lot to to extend its control on the peninsula. And by the way, with a with a mindset that um, it, it's very difficult to understand for us, as it was for the Italics themselves, especially populations like the Samnites. These were more uh, communitarian in nature, more also egalitarian, and they had ways of sharing the, you know. Um, the pastors, the, um, the, the they had a very different vision of autonomy, of, of you know, um, uh, compared to Rome, that from a certain point onwards, basically set in mind that whatever they found in front of themselves had to be conquered, and they stopped understanding any other, um, you know, perspective in this sense. Right, Rome wouldn't stop. Right, for starting from the fourth century. BC, it didn't stop up to the second century AD. Right, the Roman expansion went on in, in a way that really didn't look at anybody's, uh, you know, opinions or or perspectives or vision. They they had were 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 either to be integrated slash subjugated or wiped out. Right, and 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 this was uh, something completely new, especially for the Italic mindset of for which. After all, the same Rome had emerged. These were very warlike peoples, so much that we even called this war um, the, the the Marsic War, right? The Marsian War, because of the Marsi of these people. They're already from the name, right? You know, recalls Mars and its uh, and all these common. The, the the Italics did share, as we were saying, with Rome this kind of common background of uh, you know of, uh, the Romans did consider them part of you know part of you know, similar to, akin to them, in a way, something that they didn't feel towards the Atlantic, they didn't feel towards the Celts, um, not even towards the Etrurians, that have, in spite of the fact that Rome had basically been born at institutionally, like politically, institutionally, as a as an Etruscan city, but um, they, the, 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 as we were saying here, the Romans were coming up with something completely new to, to, to these peoples. Uh, and that's why, uh, the Roman Confederacy at this point, which is also a term that we often don't hear much, right? Um, we 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 tend to think, okay, this was the Roman Republic, more or less. Uh, we think of just a Roman oligarchy that really maintains the control on everything. And from Rome, well, the social war fundamentally proves that this is not the case. It highlights the the, the very important dynamics that existed at the base of Roman um, success. Exactly because of the connection with these allies, and it's not even a huge geographical dimension, right? Because the Celts more or less arrived to to the north, central Italy, in part. Um, so this central southern Italian reality is also, you know, largely a Penninic, right? So there are, after all, um, you know, 
not even this this huge open spaces of enormous valleys and places, you know, the, the Roman one, the Tiber Valley is basically the, the largest one. It's not a surprise that Rome was uh, rose in there. But, um, so it's a very close, uh, compact reality. It's from where most of, in fact, the, the Roman army, the Roman legionaries that conquered at this time from, from places like Greece or Spain or Africa came from. And they left also their mark, culturally speaking. We often remember how many what we call uh, Romance languages are actually uh, mostly deriving not from the Latin spoken in Rome, but fundamentally in the Latinized Italic of these various um, uh, provinces in in Italy, and so it's um, it's a quite important background that uh, was also is also to be understood uh, properly in the sense of the monus of the idea that Rome was giving something in exchange. As we were saying before, it was it a pure tyranny, um, even if de facto, you know, Rome operated by extortion in this regard. But it was a cooptation of the various elites that, by mm, remaining in friendly relations with Rome and obeying and contributing to her army, uh, could inspire to, in fact, to, to rise in importance in the Roman confederacy, in its political system, in local societies. So that, of course, it was the elite that mostly was for Romanization, for uh, this is valid for any other people that was eventually Romanized. The common people didn't want that. Who, who does want to be ruled by by someone else, right? You know, nobody. Um, but uh, there was naturally a, a possibility of promotion. And after all, the thing, as we have seen during the previous centuries, had worked, right? The, Itali the strength of the Roman Confederacy, the, the faithfulness of, of, of the Italics, had, was in many ways the determining factor of the the victory during, during the Second Punic War it is the, the single most important um, war in, in, in Roman history um, as far as you know the, the future of what, the, what we know eventually as the, the Roman Empire in fact is concerned in its development and they had stayed loyal to Rome also during the second century BC that albeit uh, uh, it was a century that saw that the rise of Rome in the Mediterranean and this astonishing military successes especially um, not much cartridge at that point but really properly the conquest of the Hellenistic world was something um, that the Romans themselves actually mattered you know considered as uh, as the most important aspect of it because the Romans like the entire world at that point was obsessed to say the least with uh, not just with the you know the, the the Hellenic culture thing about you know the Iliad, this this figures, etc. You know, and just as uh, in this warlike background, what was the model in many ways, but properly the universal empire and Alexander, right? So uh, Rome was a novelty in this frame too, because it came from a very, but I mean very different background from from the Hellenic world. Um, it was much more. Uh, ruthless uh, at some levels at least systematically speaking in a, in a warlike mentality was extremely rough like the Romans considered throughout themselves throughout all the third century BC essentially a people of of, um, of warriors right they even refused um, literature things because they didn't say you know basically if you're a literate you are you're not a you're not a man properly right you that you have to think exclusively about war it was all about this rapacious expansionistic aggressive mentality that will fundamentally remain at, at the roots of of roman civilization as a as a normal point of reference at for for centuries and centuries to come if not you know forever at some point um but this was the moment of the the, the enormous success but also the moment of the great imbalances during the second especially from the mid second, second century bc rome began to uh you know to uh to suffer fundamentally internally, uh, not much of resistance from out the outside, right? You know, Rome well, at some point was pushed on the defensive. There were famously rebellions in Macedonia. The the, the Spanish uh, the, the the Spanish war was this thing going forever going on, never basically reaching to the end. Not much because of the Romans couldn't conquer those lands. It's like that the the, the internal machine that had regularly supplied fighting force uh, 
in, in the way it had fundamentally um, been at, at the top of its efficiency in the 3rd century BC was slowing down. It was slowing down because of the famous crisis. In fact, of the recruitment of the fact that the middle classes had impoverished, they didn't have the, the means to participate to, to war autonomously in the sense that not much that they had to, to bring their equipment uh, with them. Uh, many people think that that ended with Marius, but it's something that had ended from at least you know, three cents. How do you think they actually brought their their material on their own? Of course, for example, the social, uh, but mm, the, this this social communities provided means to Rome, but of course it was all already centralized. the The main crisis was probably at the socio economical level in this regard. It was also a political one, for which the the aristocracy, the elite, and more specifically the Roman aristocracy, was absorbing literally everything. Um, was emarginating also the other, the, the poor citizens, and with violence, with private, uh, you know, uh, violence with private clienteles. Um, this was no state as we imagine it. It was essentially a set of clans that ruled the city. That especially after the Second Punic War and the bath of blood of Roman nobility at Cannae, um, had also emerged from, you know, from a gentry fundamentally that didn't, that wasn't part of the true older families or at least they, they had lost their mm, their sense of duty and of uh, undefatigable uh, i would say stoic behavior and eventually in fact in these centuries will gain importance in rome because as a, as a philosophy because it was fundamentally pretty similar to the older roman ideals um and the and and had began fundamentally just to exploit the system right this was a heavily corrupted um, reality, like basically every other country in the world, but um, at a level that had really broken the mechanisms of recruitment, of the participation to the army as, you know, uh, equation to participation to, to politics, um, and that so the collapse of that public reality and the privatization of structures of power and the the erosion uh, also of the senatorial authority because of the rise of these figures that we can already see here. This is the time of Marius. Um, the social war is complex to tell also because over it overlaps with this other, uh, for example, the, the war between uh, Marius and Sulla at the end. Uh, there were many um, branches here that go here and there. So that's why today we just introduced the thing, trying to enucleate in it more than else. Um, to make the long story short, the Allies wanted uh, to become a Roman citizens, and, and they're especially their elites, and therefore to enjoy the same rights and the same power that the, uh, the, other, the, the other nobility had. Um, the, the dark picture of this is that m many lands in Italy, uh, the, the, because this was the, the real problem, were fundamentally, especially after the Punic War, after you know the few and the destruction of those, that minority of also of Italic communities that had, re or Italic or Renlake, whatever, communities that had rebelled against, um, that had supported Hannibal fundamentally, uh, had mm, produced the extension of this, uh, of the so-called Ager Publicus, that basically was this properly Roman-held land that technically belonged, as the res publica was, you know, was fundamentally all about, to, to all the Roman citizens. But that, uh, and that therefore the state could take back um, if needed, but that for the moment uh, every Roman citizen could settle in uh, without control, right? The, the, simply the law accepted that if you had enough means to occupy enormous amount of land, you could take it. So this is properly the, 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 the mean through which the, um, the oligarchs had managed even to, to, uh, to out uh, to throw out all the even the smaller uh, Roman citizens that simply s settled that uh, there's you know small landowners, simple farmers, and had less means. So it was really an abusive, violent reality, um, and impoverishing the, the very bulk of this um, uh, Italian peasantry that should have provided the bulk of the, the Roman army. Naturally, the the allies uh, in this all participated. Um, to the to the 
the political discourse, at least to access, you know, for themselves the the post to access in Roman affairs themselves. Sometimes uh, they did even under cover because there was also no way to properly control what was what at one point. Because they simply wanted to enjoy the benefits as well. The populations were instead more conservative, more traditional. They still felt bitterly against Rome because of the subjugation. They had this warlike ideas of rebellion, of, uh, of freedom, of uh, equality, at least in, in the way it was intended at the time among these, um, you know, barely more than tribal populations. As we were saying before, they, they had improved, after all, even just infrastructurally, you know, through Romanization. Rome had opened this, these enormous markets, had built roads, had built cities, had built aqueducts. I mean, it was really making this, this whole world function in a way that, paradoxically, in fact, had brought these same communities to, to have their own importance and efficiency. After all, you know, the, the Romans could have not have exploited them otherwise because a place that is devoid of of, uh, of people to, to send to war that, that you know, can um, uh, that, that can't be provided through these local uh, elites, right, uh, it, would, it would have been of no use. Right, but the Roman aristocracy was, in this sense, very conservative because they they, they didn't want, and this is a bit the, um, in a nutshell, the history of senatorial policy throughout all the history of the Roman Empire, not to integrate further. Right, they wanted to say, okay, th these were also newcomers. Right, they, these weren't. They were also people coming sometimes outside of Rome. They they were they had been Italic themselves at some point, but. They, uh, they now, well, as soon as they entered the Senate, they wanted to maintain their prerogatives and not extending them to others. And this was, um, you know, I think a valid key of interpretation of Roman history is properly to realize that every great uh, enlightened, I would say, emperor was, uh, or ruler, um, was the one that did actually extend citizenship to this other realities because it gave new fuel to Rome. It allowed its expansion, and it's properly through this, um, you know, through these reforms, as we will see also at the end of the war, that Roman society did change, but it it had once again new fuel to to send out to to expand once again and to solve the impasse of the of the crisis of the second century BC. The Marian reform is also another great. Um, it it really you know you think it's a military reform, but uh, it, it has a very few uh, of strictly military uh, in terms of reformation proper. It was essentially a political reform, right? The military was already the the way it was already, right? Marius didn't. There is a tradition about him, but he he was surely a great commander, a great surely reorganized, surely reinforced. But um, it's. Uh, you know the introduction of so many novelties in the Roman armies that sometimes date back to you know to, to the siege of Bay, right? That, that were absolutely not invented by the slightest by Marius, were already there since centuries, and this is also a point is really heard uh, around. But uh, so the we can start from pointing out how the Gracchi, that as you know, had promoted this important series of reforms, mostly uh, frumentary, also about the extension of the citizenship. It was um, uh, Caius Gracchus had proposed, for example, to extend the Roman citizens uh, citizenship to the Latins and the Latin citizenship to the Italics. Um, eventually, as we will see with the war, for example, the, the, the Cisalpine Gauls will get uh, the, the Latin, um, the, the Latin citizenship, the Italics will get the Roman one. So, um, it, it went by grades. Uh, Caius Gracchus actually didn't present such dramatically, uh, you know, so, such radical reforms at all, right? They were sometimes even, uh, they were actually quite moderate. It's just that they met any, you know, they, they nobody in the Senate was, most people, in, you know, majority in the Senate didn't accept these at all. And you know how the thing actually handed for him as a, and his brother. But among the other things, as in fact, the the Italics had been awakened by these proposals in Roman policy at the time. The Sulci um, were at this point 
mm, fighting for and ready to fight literally from, from a military point of view with this uh, for, for this rights um, so the breaking point arrived in 95 uh, BC when the uh, that year's consuls Lucius Licinius Crassus and Quinctus Mucius Scaevola proposed a law that instituted a tribunal that judged uh, those who have uh, abusively basically um, inserted themselves within the Roman Kibes, the, the citizenry. Um, this was quite common, as you understand, because you know the Italic aristocracy interacted with Rome quite openly from an economical point. I mean, they, they were after all a few all together, a few hundreds of kilometers away. Maximum, they, Rome was the, the largest center. They had interests, traffic, goods, you know, all the trade from the rich Italian interland. Uh, so uh, there was properly the infiltration of these elements, even in the, the Roman society, and the not properly the juridical sanctioning of their citizenry, but you know, s some let themselves pass for Roman citizens, others would simply enter the system competing with others, and, and this was not uh, acceptable. So this was a, a, a conservative law that specifically aimed at blocking this phenomenon. Um, and this was called the Lex Licinia Mucia, right? That uh, increased, uh, having passed the uh, disappointment, the resentment, especially among the Italic elites, that, as we've seen, were desiring to directly participate to the political management of the Roman Republic. So Marcus Livius Drusus, that was son of uh, Caius Gracchus. Uh, opponent, right? So that, uh, b which proves, by the way, how Roman politics here was was not much about the division of the you know optimates, the populares, as it will happen, especially from the later, from the following generation. Uh, it was just a matter of contingent uh, opportunity, right, and profit and benefit. So the same family that had eventually taken out the Gracchi brothers now was presenting this law in um, uh, in 91 BC uh, Drusus as a tribune specifically proposed a series of laws that constituted an organical plan to solve this you know uh, quite old controversies between the Senate the Knights the proletariat and the Italics so each of these parts um, finding you know a greater advantage to uh, compensate the loss of a privilege could have uh, finally cooperate for political and social stability in a way so it was a, a big compromise in a way Drusus um, also resumed uh, his father's colonial program and proposed a, a, an agrarian law and a fermentarian one with uh, almost gratuitous distributions of grain as in the project of Saturninus that we made a video on incidentally. Um, this was basically to content the uh, both the rural and urban plebs. The colonies, the, the coloni colonizing policy was about essentially creating new uh, Roman cities abroad and therefore also extending basically the uh, you know the the broader interests of this you know mostly proletarians and and veterans that were at this point after the Marian reform did the same thing as you know um and and therefore it was something that evidently pushed towards a a liberalization of, of the whole system also a, a judiciary law proposed a compromise on the uh juries of the tribunals that were contended between the senators and the knights. Drusus intended to restore to the senators the uh, quaestiones perpetue, the majestate et de repetundis, that were this, um, you know, a permanent court established starting from the second century BC to, to judge various crimes, you know, they, they were in fact the repetundae, the inuria, um, uh, and, and the Maestas and so on, 
Um, and the Duana de Repetundis was established first. It was called to judge the crimes of extortion of magistrates of senatorial rank or of or ordinary citizens, tax collectors, for example, committed in the provinces governed by Rome. Right? And this was like an extremely powerful mean because the accused could have been guilty of cases to of theft of, or embezzlement, dispossession of property of natives or theft against the imperial treasury as well during the exercise of the office. And if you look at the Roman provinces, especially the richest one in in, in, in Asia, for example, was like the, the perfect thing, you know, where especially the night, but the, 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 the worst imaginable in this regard. So it was a very, a very important political weapon that could uh, redirect, you know, fluxes of, of money, of, you know, of, of bribes and so on more more easily. So um, the the senators and the equites, the, the, the knights, had, um, had battled over this for, for a long time. Um, and uh, and the reason actually that this contented the, the, the both the, the senators and, and the knights actually in this reform that, that, that there would have been a, yeah, a, um, a restorement of, to the senators of these tribunals but doubling the senate itself with the um, inscription of 300 equites. The senators didn't like this, of course, because they didn't intend to share their own traditional privileges, nor the knights, actually, because uh, the equestrian class, which uh, considered with perplexity the loss of its best exponents that once entered in the Senate would have uh, embraced its, its political ideology and abandoned the the, the, the equestrian class interest uh, as a was, so they would, would basically become like senators because also let's be honest that's also how what they wanted right there is a bit this old-fashioned historiography that says that the equestrians were more like like the economical the business gentry right but that their aim was exactly the same one of the senators it's just that they were in the lower rank and they, they just tried to rise in the rank but uh, the central point of Drusus' program was the concession of Roman citizenry to the Italics that would have been largely compensated of their own agar publicus for the agrarian assignations through the equiparation uh, in, in the rights to the Kives. So, big, really big change. The, the consul Lucius Marcius Philippus became the most mm, decisive and uh, authoritative uh, foe of Drusus and had mm, and became basically the, 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 the exponent of the conservatives that, um, among the other things, feared naturally the, 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 the complete messing up of the statal structure with the mixture of a number, a, a much higher number of citizens than one of the mm, previous kibas, right? Um, the, there was an enormous increase after the social war, in fact, of the, the Roman citizens that arrived by the 70s, something like 910,000, something like that. Um, so, but very violent contrasts um, took over um, at this point. This was, uh, especially after the Gracchus time, nobody cared about anything anymore. Even the tri tribunal Sacrosanctitas had been violated because simply a tribunal had been assassinated. So, we're talking about very fierce um, clashes, proper bloody ones. And um, the Italics uh, began immediately to to push for, for these laws to be passed. In some Italic centers, uh, especially among the Marsi, in this mountainous region of, of central Italy, guided by Quintus Papadius Siva, activists' councils were formed, and there, there was even a point at which 10,000 Marsi um, marched armed towards Rome, and eventually they were stopped, they were convinced to, to come back, but this was uh, a pretty, uh, you know, uh, dangerous situation, a as you understand. Um, the Etruscan and Umbrian elite, so this part of the northern 
Italic area uh, that dominated over a great part uh, of the people, uh, of their own people that lived essentially in similar conditions to the, you know, to serve them, right? Um, Etruscan and Umbrian societies were very stratified, very elitary, very aristocratic, almost feudal in a way. So they, they weren't, the, their elites weren't f favorable to um, a juridical parity in the Roman Civitas, because this would have meant that also their uh, their their serfs would have gained uh, rights that would have dispossessed the, the aristocracy in a way. So as we will see, these two peoples eventually participated to the Italic uh, revolt, but in a very, you know, cold uh, fashion. Uh, the the Etruscans, as you know, weren't properly Italic. They weren't even the Indo-Europeans, but the Umbrians were in were Italic, and they yet were were similar to Etruscans. After all, they were just in in the east and the up in the heart of, of the Apennine, so they shared this this kind of um, similar views. Uh, after all. Um, in Rome, some plots started, and Marcus Philippus declared illegal the procedure followed for Drusus' laws that, um, uh, so that the uh, rogatio on the uh, uh, Italic citizenship was not even voted, right? And uh, extremist followers of the council also sent. Uh, an assassin to kill Drusus, who was attacked. Um, he lived. Uh, he was wounded. He lived some time afterwards. The old Italics in their cities were making religious ceremonies for for his health. Um, eventually, he died, and um, this was specifically the 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 event in uh, the November ninety one B C that made the so-called so social war break out. In the winter between 91 and 90 BC, Romans and Italics basically went at war against each other. Right. Uh, so, as we were saying before, we will not talk today about the details, the military details of this war, that was something enormous. We're talking about um, 100,000 Roman legionnaires against 100,000 Italic legionnaires, um, and these, as we were saying before, they were properly the, the same, the same thing. It was basically the Roman army at one point going against one another. Uh, this was not much of a like an Italic revolt, right? It, it was properly like a civil war, so much that you know someone even paralleled it to you know to the American Civil War, but you know, just by comparison, because it really you know at this point. The, the fate of Rome and one of the Italics were deeply intertwined, so it, it was really, it, it shook heavily the foundations of the system because it was basically happening what Hannibal would have liked to happen back in the day, with the Italics all rising against Rome and dispossessing her. Um, it was an extremely violent war, right? We're talking about here if you think about the atrocities of the ancient world, even just by by the foe in terms of what the the morals of the times really were. Um, the world was dark at the time, right? These were also also some part of the some more civilized realities. But for the rest, the beliefs, the the, the mere uh, think of what it means to, to live in a world where you see, you know, one one th one third of of your children dying, or um, you know, life uh, as it is, or that you can dispose of a slave, you know, killing him, you know, in a blink of an eye because it's your right, or just killing a person in a, in a much more um, use but this was just already a more civilized reality where, you know that the Romans had proceeded to pacify naturally this war the first and foremost was about these were peoples that had been subjugated by Rome um, some even harshly think about the Samnites right the, the the some of the most important movements took pray, place in um, as we will see among the so-called the Peuchetti and the Samnitas, in fact, that were wanted to, to carry out this pincer movement against Rome from central and southern Italy. Um, and uh, uh, the, 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 the revolt broke out in, in the Picanum, also in uh, Ausculum. There was this given the signal where the, the Roman uh, citizens, um, the local uh, legate, were, were, were massacred in, in the local theater that still exists today. Um, Roman women were scalped. Um, there, there, were, there were 
entire uh, Grumentum was with all exter all its civilians were exterminated. It was an extremely violent and cruel and, and evil. Um, uh, pro properly, this this speaks for for the enormous interests that were at stake uh, in this in this reality. Um, the most heat and the most energetic of the rebellious peoples were the Marsi, as we were saying before. So so much that for the social war we talk also about the bellum italicum to define specifically the you know the italic character of the revolt, but also the the Marsian or Marsican war. Um, because of the activism of, of the Mars that according to certain authors had always uh, basically had never been defeated by the Romans also back in the day and also Rome had never won without their help on the field because these were all troops that fought from generations and generations for Rome that was their task uh, but more generally the Osco-Sabellic peoples so this other this the major chunk of the Italic peoples next to the Latins, the, the Latin Faliscans, and a f very few others, but were that were the bulk, right? Of especially of these all this Apenninic community, we're talking about the bulk of the demographic strength properly of of the peninsula, um, rebelled against the state, and what Rome was in a way losing control on on virtually in all of these land, right? Um, so it was that it's literally next door. To the rebellion also adhered the Apulians, as we were saying before, the Umbrians and the Etruscans participated late and in a limited way. The um, the Latin colonies, except for Venusia, that was in the center, a very important strategic location, open into Apulia, um, and the Hellenic communities. Um, did not rise because the Latins at this point were um, too connected to the Roman reality. They, as we've seen, they had much more benefits than the Italics already. They were essentially rich, um, you know, uh, communities. They they had also their own military duties towards Rome, but they they had it fundamentally better. They were just in Rome, like in, in the Latium broadly meant in the surround. So they were very close. The Greeks didn't care couldn't care less uh, because the Greeks were always living within this mm, kind of bubble in which they, they believed that were still fundamentally independent and the Rome did not exist they didn't want to participate nor to mix with the Italics, were the Italics barbarians right, uh, including the Romans by the way, from the, from the Hellenic perspective so much that actually the, um, the Italics themselves obliged some of the Atlantic cities of the of the south to to participate at their side um, with the threat of destruction. In fact, cities like Region and I don't remember which are were destroyed in the process because they they refused to support the Italics. Um, the also the the Greeks lived essentially of trade, but mostly they didn't contribute excessively from a military point of view. Uh, among the goals um, in Sizzlepin Gaul, I mean, uh, there was some participation both with the Italics and with the Romans. Uh, Sizzlepin Gaul here was mm, uh, a particular reality because it, it was a, actually a very important, it was gaining importance heavily, especially that it would be clear during the civil wars in Caesars um, or Octavian's times, that whoever controlled Sizzlepin Gaul fundamentally controlled the military resources of Italy because this was a land was uh, gradually Romanized and the social war actually pushed uh, forward, um, accelerated this trend at the end um, because it was further colonized by uh, by the Romans and therefore this Gallo-Roman reality began to contribute decisively also with the, the legions etc. in the future so it would be very very important but they were fundamentally too I mean, demographically speaking, they, they didn't have a chance uh, to intervene, let's say, against the center-south, so they were fundamentally divided on what to do. Not because the Gauls had ever liked, even in their the Roman conquest, but, you know, aside from the fact that a process of Romanization now, since more than one century had been started, but generally speaking, they they still were not fully integrated, so they, they also had some proper limitations to participate to this very thing. Um, 
the rebel allies uh, also organized themselves in a system that was exemplified on the base of the Roman one. They had a senate, consuls, praetors. Now this is very important because um, it, it shows how much Romanity had entered the, these communities that already had had, I mean historically speaking, their own, their own councils, their own magistrates of course, uh, even before the Roman conquest, but they they now wanted specifically, also for propag propagandistic reason, to present themselves as a alternative to Rome. This is a bit, you know, it should require actually some um, better definition because it's not that they wanted to overthrow Rome. What they were fighting for was exactly to get the Roman citizenship. But uh, there were mixed feelings as well. Right, because initially, as we've seen, this rebellion started as a an aristocratic struggle uh, for Roman citizenship. But when the, bro uh, the, the war broke out, many populations, uh, including the ones that were had been historically more, you know, hostile to Rome, read the Samnites, that were also, by the way, the most the most important, most numerous. Um, began also a, as peoples properly to to go against their own aristocracies to convince them not to fight for romanization which they did not want but for freedom right so the older the uh, ideal of you know let's destroy rome fundament um and th there are important developments in this because the confederation of Italic peoples that Rome had always kept divided fundamentally with separated uh, foidera, so with mm, separated relations, exclusive relations with Rome, right? It's not that they were allied with one another, they, they had always been controlled exclusively by Rome. Um, now was aggregated because of the military needs, right? Also just uh, from a for strategical needs. And they even chose a capital on, on their own. There was Corfinium in the Pelignan area. There was also renamed Italic. Right? And this is very important because the r rebels began also to mint coins famously with uh, propagandistic depictions of the Italic Taurus that knocks down the Roman Shivolf. Right, and in these coins, in these representations, you find for the first time this this um, the name of Italia, right? F for the first time, used as a political uh, name, right? Italia in Latin or Vitellio in Oscan, right? And and therefore stressing here properly an Italic identity opposed to Rome, or at least. Um, struggling but whichever the interests that could vary could could be for be within the Roman system but probably as Italic people or peoples let's say better so this is very very important because it never fundamentally exists right it's like we would discuss this from for other realities like the Gauls for example that at a certain point under uh, their king uh, Torex they kind of stuck together for for the first time, because it was all separated realities. In Italy, the integration of the, all these communities had, had been accelerated, as we've seen, there were also more developed journeys, so it was clearer and kind of easier to, to, to believe this, but fundamentally, what did an Umbrian have to do with a, with a Brutian, for example? What did much also, but, but even just a Napoleon with a, with an Etruscan, I mean, they were well, the Etruscans didn't even speak Italic, but, you know, even among the same Italics, right, it, nobody had ever kind of looked at each other as themselves, right? The Samnites, for example, had a sort of national feeling with, of all these various tribes that considered themselves as Samnites, but even in their, uh, the, the context were, were loose, as we've seen also the um, estimated autonomy, freedom on their own. So, this is the usual thing in, in the past, that we, there were not the modern national feelings, but surely for the first time we have, in, at least in this case, the the gradual emergency of the of the idea of an Italic reality, so much that this will be, as you know, 
you know, especially late, late Republican and early imperial times always dictate um, the same um, uh, the same balance of the, the, the Roman political and social affairs because the nat naturally the Italics, once they gained the citizenship, what did they do? They didn't want to extend it to, I don't know, the Gauls or uh, it was the same old story. It had always been like that and um, then we know how this, the history went but uh, it, it, it's not to be given for granted and naturally these connections had some value for these local identities. So from a military point of view, the Romans found themselves in trouble, right? Because they were fighting against an army that was identical to their own. Well armed, well trained, exactly like them. Because for so many years, the Italics had shared the same battles, the same commanders. They served um, in the Roman military as auxiliary troops of, of the Roman citizens and even in larger quantity than the Romans, um, notoriously. The, uh, so, Rome employed its best generals. You were talking about Marius, Sulla, Pompeius, Strabo, um, for example, uh, and they achieved some, some results, but they, uh, also the rebels, had pretty good commanders that knew how to inflict losses to, to the Romans. Uh, the consuls uh, Publius Rutilius Lupus and Lucius Porcius Cato fell in, 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 in combat. The war was very bloody on both sides and it was cause of great destructions. And even if Rome uh, achieved a meaningful military success, it was understood that Drusus' adversaries had been wrong right that this all this whole thing had Rome in, even won at this point would have not been worth it and, and especially that it would have co kept cause if you know had the italics not won their in, in their citizenship they they would have continued to create problems so it, so that the only way to solve this was to grant the citizenship so in 90 BC the consul Lucius Julius Caesar proposed a law that gave the Roman Civitas to the allies that had remained faithful to Rome because naturally there were Italics that were fighting for Rome in this war um, since the beginning but also to those that would depose immediately the arms. So this was a kind of paradox because basically now the Romans began to fight in order to enforce the Italic citizenship on those people that instead now were fighting more for freedom rather than for further integration. Um, so the Lex Julia de Civitate, Latinis et Socis Danta, so to, to give essentially to the, to the Latins and to the Italics, uh, did not put an end to the war, as we've seen, because especially among the Sabellian group, there were certain extremistic instances. Um, the Samnites just couldn't digest to be subjugated by the Romans, and this is this is a very important. At some point, we'll have to talk about the Samnitic wars back in the day in fourth century, because it, it's. Studying them is a great lesson of civilization. Right? It really gives you an idea of what these two realities were, and how really how the Romans were, and how these Italics really were by by nature, by by culture. Right? They they were very different. The Romans never understood the idea that they could be, for example, humiliated by these peoples. That they, they simply felt themselves to be superior. Um, and, and just consider that the Samnites were probably the only people that the Romans ever uh, estimated among the Italics because they were essentially the, the only ones that could compete with them at some point. Right, The Samnitic Wars could be won by the Samnites at some point. It was nothing deterministic about Rome winning them. Uh, but also there is a reason why eventually Rome won. So there are there will be many many stories here but of mostly of violence and, and and destruction but we can't skip them but you can imagine what this whole thing really was um it was a simply as we were saying before it was simply a anticipation of the civil wars that would have 
you know, happily started, you know, with the um, first century BC and devastated. But we're talking about peoples in arms. I mean, if you really want to consider what the the manpower potential of 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 Italy was at the time, right? You count that the Romans deployed, as we were saying before, one hundred thousand legionnaires. The uh, the the Italics one hundred thousand themselves. We're talking about two hundred thousand men. Then when you wonder how the Romans uh, conquered the world, but these were probably the the manpower resources and further to come, right? Eventually with the colonization, with the the extension of of the Roman. Um, the Roman conquests and settlements of Roman citizenry. So, very, uh, it, it's really impressive, right? It really tells you at that point how, um, right, how many resources were hidden beyond the the crisis that also the Marian reform had solved, and uh, giving fundamentally start to a further. Roman uh, expansion in the first century BC. Um, in 89, the tribunes Caius Papirius Carbo and Marcus Plautius Silvanus promoted uh, a law that perfectioned the citizenship concession. Uh, to the Lex to this Lex Plautia Papiria, so taking name as always this is usually from the from these call from the politician, um, was added the uh, uh, another provision of the consul Cnaeus Pompeius Strabo that assigned the Latin right to the population north of the Po River, while the Civitas Optimo Iure, so the full Roman citizenship, would have been granted to Cisalpine Gaul in 439 BC. So this gives you an idea of how also the Romans began to re-address uh, fundamentally the the, the, pr the the division of their 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 control, their rule, their political system by incorporating also further communities into this system. Um, that now began to include it was giving italic citizenship fundamentally even to the to the Gauls. This is very important because the uh, you know up to this point fundamentally aside from the the Atraki, I mean the, the the whole thing had remained within central southern Italy. Now even the north was included now in the in the Roman citizenship in a in a few generations and already with the Latin right. Uh, at this point. So with the grant of citizenship all the Italian peninsula and the Latin colonies of Cisalpine Gaul also became Agar Romanus. Right. So this allowed what fundamentally the Italics as we've seen had wanted that was to seize the land in this in this territory uh, and extend it in a way. So part of naturally of the extension of the citizenship had specifically to do also with the extension of the of the available land for which this could be uh, this 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 rights could be exercised. So the territory was organized with the old system of the municipia of the municipalities that were internal subdivisions of the Roman state. Right, the municipia were based fundamentally on the city. Right, this was also a great process of urbanization. Uh, in the Italic communities was therefore started a great process of stadal building based on the city that developed throughout all the first century BC because the exercise of the civic rights uh, demanded urban structures right um, and if a, a urban center did not exist it was built according to the Roman scheme that comprehended a temple to the Capizoline triad the forum, um, the and the uh, place of reunion for the local senate, let's say the local counts. So the Romans really operated like this, and this is fascinating about Roman colonization: is that wherever you go, even in the smallest Roman municipality, you see the thing replicated like in Rome. Right? You have the, the temple, the forum, the senate. It, it's it, sometimes even very compact, right? But it's there, and this was 
specifically and, and as important this really makes you understand the difference between you know a simple cooptation like a, any empire could have been doing uh, by that time and probably the extension of a citizenship that no other empire had ever done right and that is truly the key for understanding the success and the achievements of Roman uh, of the Roman Empire otherwise this thing would have not existed right if Romans had not granted their citizenship that it would never even come out of Latium right the Roman Empire the Roman civilization all what it means for us today and was has dramatically impacted the history of the world Europe and the world Mediterranean and of the world world at this point um, is based exactly on this on the Munus on the idea that you, you know, have rights be part of a political community as long as you contribute to that political community. It's properly a contract, right? Uh, it's properly the, the realization that you can become fully equal to uh, the, the citizen of this system as long as you contribute to the system itself, as, as long as you earn and deserve it, right? So any uh, you know sinister and dark uh, realization about the the crudity the, uh, the, the 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 violence and the oppression of the Roman reality must always pass through the fact that this has been done by every single reality in the world from the smallest tribes that lived in a condition of utter and sheer violence and, and beliefs and moral standards to the greatest empires that literally wiped out hundreds of thousands of people with a blink of an eye, without any scruple. But the difference that Rome made is exactly here, and this is what it makes its greatness. So without this, we would have not had the world that we know. It. Because this really extended to a world that was illiterate about it, the concept of public authority, based on an individual responsibility. This is not about the celestial overruler that you can find in China. This is all-powerful all and can do everything. This is not the, the barbarian tribe that simply says, you know, I, I'm stronger, therefore I can come if I, if I manage to, to slaughter you and enslave you and rape you. It, it's fine because I, uh, I, I do as I win. Uh, I can do whatever I want. This is something never seen, right? It's something that preluded in many ways and also gave fertile ground to the moral um, dualistic responsibility that is also the base of Western civilization of the Judeo-Christian tradition of the idea that there is a, an outside reality and an inside, an inner one, a, a responsible one, a, a one of conscience, right? And this is these are two elements that coupled together really made the world as we know it. Because before this, nothing like this existed. But I mean nothing like this. This is unique. You don't find it anywhere else. Right. Um, and I, I can't stress this enough. I don't think, on Schwerpunkt, I, I think I've never insisted much on this thing. But objectively, I, I give it for granted because I presume that any person who studied Roman history knows this. But I realize that this is often not the case, that some people are just interested in projecting their own modern nationality on the ancient world and taking sides like as if they were being fans of a football team, um, that's not civilization, it's not intelligent, I presume that those are not even Western people by the, the, the moral standards that, that this world taught to us. And, I, um, and it is really beautiful to study this reality because here we find every single people in the world that was accepted by Rome in this, right? It doesn't matter what you look like, what gods you believe in, uh, how you go dressed if you speak Latin you you obey to Roman laws you you work for Rome you serve for Rome and you you don't infringe the law you um, you're not a criminal you are unequal to the truest Roman that has been born in the very heart of Rome and this is uh, something that at the only thought of it makes me uh, you know makes me really realize how lucky uh, I am uh, and how much we are to belong to Western civilization because this is not to say we're better than others or just intrinsically like a, ch a chart like a like a, a, a list of um, you know hierarchy of, of civilizations but it's truly um, 
playing the chords of of our mm, deepest uh, moral paradigms and that, that were known in this crude and primitive and extremely violent world as also the Roman one uh, really was in in embryo right and from which developed much of what we truly have today and and never forget this ne never give for granted this empire to have existed because without that you you wouldn't properly know what your t today's identity and and moral value are right um for the rest, uh, this whole history is is very bitter, as you understand. Um, the uh, the Italics won their battle, also at a heavy cost in 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 some cases, but they won their participation to the Roman political life with the vote in the Comitia um, that continued to to work in the urbs, were mostly. Also, what the senators feared here is that the city would be overwhelmed by italics, by immigrants. It actually didn't happen at all, and there is no evidence. So there's a very few people came, and it were mostly the elite, the aristocracy, that came to the city to integrate gradually within the Roman uh, ruling class. And the municipia, with their territories, defined by borders, distinguished by borders from the other municipalities, had a complete autonomy in their local administration as well as this is also the case in this world without uh, a true centralistic state I mean true the, the, the Roman Empire still ruled over communities that self-ruled right and that just had to to obey to, to Rome uh, at certain levels but still with a negotiation and still with large autonomies that after all was the only possible way to to rule an empire at the time, because uh, this the, the social war proves this, because the social war proves completely the um, the, the, the you know the, the 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 fact that you cannot pretend to use despotically these communities as your allies as as you wish. Right, I, I can't stress this enough, and even more, and we will see it hopefully at some point. We're talking about, as we were saying before, especially the, the fourth, the third century BC. What is extraordinary in this model is that it actually worked. Right, that this was no war for, um, well, as we were saying before, the, the people were naturally hoping for for different realities. But he, even in here, what was the real chance? The that I don't know the Samnites could come back to be an independent people. Like at the time of the Annibalic War, this thing was a, a concrete problem. It could happen, right? Concrete possibility. At this time, it wasn't, right? In any way, this would have ended. Ended the uh, at this point, the, the Italics were too intertwined with the destiny of Rome. There was nothing to do with that to districate them from from it, right? They had too many interests in common. They, they, the Italics, as we've seen, had responded brilliantly to Romanization in this regard. I mean, they had literally been fighting for Rome everywhere. Uh, if Rome hadn't been there, they, or it had been less powerful, they, w they would have not accepted this. But the point is that they, they showed also this. Uh, I wouldn't say democratic because it's a bit too anachronistic. I mean, not much anachronistic term. Um, but still, you know, inappropriate because this was not a great, you know, democrat. But it, it shows the, let's say, the contractual nature of Roman power. It, it uh, in its consensual aspect, right? The fact that you cannot press too much these people because otherwise they would rebel, right? If by the first century BC, after more than one hundred and more years of Romanization, at latest. The fact that these peoples could all rebel altogether like it happened in here shows naturally, first of all, yeah, the, the, the pressure, the, the inequality, the, oppre the oppression of this system, but at the same time, the fact that these guys had preserved their own autonomy. They had preserved their own force. They weren't slaves. They weren't um, conquered people uh, that just had to, you know, to obey and nothing else. 
they were rising, they had risen at this point actually to the same level of Rome. Um, and this is exactly what I wanted to stress. This, this system worked that when Hannibal lured them in front of, you know, after Cana, he said, you know, this massacred all the Roman citizens and uh, spared all the Italics, hoping that this would make them, you know, turn them to, to, to him against Rome. The system held, right? There is, there is nothing more astonishing than what the Romans suffered after the defeat of Cannae, than Hannibal's realization that the that the Roman Confederation did not break, right? It, which was much worse. That, that you know, as a feeling, uh, in terms of of sheer level of devastation, than than just the defeat of Cannae. And, and and the Italics decided. It wasn't Rome that decided. The Italics had the possibility at that point to shake themselves off of the, the Roman yoke. They didn't. And they didn't because they realized what the benefits of Romanization at that point were. And this is history. This is not a matter of personal interpretation. This is literally what they did. And, and we know that that was the option. So ask them if you if you disagree if you ask don't ask me because that, that's what they have done not me um, and uh, this is perhaps the single most important aspect to reflect on right the consensuality of this contract the um, the 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 fact that there was room for these people to decide the the end would have been being exterminated uh, uh, ask the the Capuans, ask uh, the Samnites, ask those who you know the Samnites were eventually, you know, Samnites actually sided with Marius at this point. That when Sulla marched on Rome, because this all started the, the, also the civil war afterward, it was a mess. Sulla had all the Samnites in Rome exterminated. Right. Uh, so the Romans w didn't go, as you know, that the Romans couldn't care less. Uh, th as we were saying before, this was not a world in which people actually cared about other people's lives. This is something that we have matured recently in time. Um, they cared for making things function, and this thing went to function actually in a pretty damn effective way. So much that this people actually conquered the world at the time on these very basis. So. Uh, I don't know how much the social... I haven't checked today, for example, how... I don't know, how many videos there are on the social war, what happened, of, you know, talking about the war and the battles and the rulers and the leaders and all this stuff. Here we're talking specifically about the, this matter of political and institutional uh, relevance, in my opinion, that is truly what this story should teach us. And... Mm, frankly, I'm fed up just of the um, um, simplistic, uh, superficial, but also really uninterested approach to this parts of, of history. As if, oh, that's, that was the Romans, right? You know, if I leave, I don't know, in another play, I don't care. After all, we were the Romans. Here we had another people. We can, this, this is exactly the that background of of moral weakness because that that's to me the point right that knowing history reinforces your political and civic education in a way you you, you won't believe so this kind of s slimy s relativism that we have towards some of the single most important phases of our past is is become so sectarian so mm, stereotypical so predictable i i can't stand it frankly, and I make these videos hoping to, to shake people's conscience in this sense, to to show what is that history truly means. Not battles, videos with animations, you can, you know, it's like w watching a video game and, you know, uh, being ha content of that, but probably reflecting of what the past means. That is something I don't see anymore. I don't see it anymore. I don't see it in art, I don't see it in popular culture, I don't see it sometimes not even in, in the historical profession is becoming too uh, too narrow minded too hyper specialistic has lost the, um, the, the 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 memory of its of its duty that is to educate people 
which just speaking of Romans, since we speak their language to educate means educare, that means literally to lead out, right? This means education. Learn etymologies because you don't speak languages just for ch by random chance, right? So reflect on what education means, to be taken out of something. That is essentially what Kant would have said, like, the condition of, of inferiority that people place themselves in, which ignorance truly is, especially at this point in history. So aside from this, uh, I hope that we will talk about, of course, that th this stuff, as we're saying, this is just an introduction. We'll talk about this more, we'll give way more background. We'll talk also about the war, of course, that's an interesting thing. But the fundamentals here, I hope you will not forget. So I hope for now that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time.